Hello, we are back, we are cozy, I've got a fresh cup of tea. This next section is not about my long COVID symptoms, but it's about a, the trail of events that has led me to this spot, which was all kicked off my long COVID. If you like to wallow in other people's misery, you're going to love the two tales I have to tell you next. So work. As I mentioned in my last video, I work for a US-based company called GitHub, which is owned by Microsoft. I work as a software engineer. Um, I've been off work since I first got sick in January 2022, although I did have like a brief stint of trying to go back to work that failed, and that was before my second infection. I had three months of sick leave, which I was paid in full for, and then after that I was supposed to have this income protection insurance, um, which is a group in income protection insurance policy, so it's like taken out on the company's behalf for all of its employees to cover them in the case that they are unable to work for whatever reason. So that's meant to be 75% of my salary. Um, they said it was gonna take maybe like a month to sort out. So from whenever it was, May, sometime April, May, 2022, um, they, the company just decided to pay me that 75% themselves that they would recoup from the insurance once it was all sorted out. To explain this next bit, I have to <laughs> go back a sec. Um, I uh, I do lots of like other things outside of work. It was part of the reason why I joined that company in particular is that they don't care. Like you can have your own personal IP. You can do, as long as it's not on company time, like you can do whatever projects on the side, make whatever money on the side and they don't own it, uh, which is key. A few months before I got sick, I started working really intensely on this art project um, and I was really feverish to launch it. And I did mention that in my first video, it was like part of the reason why I was so busy when I got sick. Um, and then I, f I got it to like 80%-ish when I got sick. And then I was like, oh, I'm not gonna be able to work on this. So it's an art project, but it's with code. So it's just writing code, like kind of similar to my work, but also not because it's all, A, it's like creative coding, which is very different to like software development, web development, um, but it's also like, I'm just working on stuff that I know really well. Like it's a very small code base. It's like all created by me. It's a much easier space to work in cognitively than like trying to navigate a load of shit that you don't understand that a bunch of people have built over years and years. So when we were first applying for the insurance, I asked, am I allowed to continue working on side projects? Like if I have the odd hour here or there where I feel well enough to use my computer and I wanna do something productive, am I allowed to keep working on like public facing side projects and they said yeah we actually think that's good because we want you to still stay keen and sharp and like we agree that working on like a little side project is not equivalent to having to like sit at a desk for eight hours a day and be on zoom calls constantly like it's not the same thing so if you can do that but you can't do your job we understand um so i didn't work on it for ages um, and then slowly I just worked, started working on it more and more. And then by the time it got to around time I posted my last video, um, in December, 2022, I had no money because this insurance case that was meant to be resolved in a month was still not resolved by December when we applied for it in May. And GitHub like just stopped paying me at the end of October because they were like, look, this thing hasn't come through yet. Like we're just paying you out of the goodness of our own heart we're gonna stop paying you. So I had no income. And I suddenly was like, oh gosh, I need to make money. And like, if this insurance doesn't come through, what am I gonna do? So I decided at that point that I wanted to sell this generative art project as an NFT, which not an NFT, it's a collection of NFTs. Whatever you know about NFTs, if you aren't intimately involved in, in the realm, uh, cast it aside, it's not your, your average, NFT like shitty drop. It's um it's like fine art. It's a very uh it's a very prestigious area basically. Um and it's highly respected and I was invited to publish this project on the most important platform one can sell generative art on called Art Blocks and I was invited to the curated project which is like mega, right? So this was going to launch in March. So the insurance <laughs> Uh, this is a long tale, I'm sorry, it's complex. There are a lot of moving parts. So started in May, um, did all the forms and stuff. I was like, what's going on? Cause it was August and I was like, what's happening? And they said, oh, they didn't send us your medical record from 2020. We asked for it from 2020 and they only sent it from January, 2022. And I was like, okay, presumably they want to know that I was healthy before I got sick. 
Um, so I approved things, but it literally took months for them to figure out this whole thing of getting an extra two years of medical records. So they didn't get them until November. And then I finally got the, um, the outcome of my insurance thing on a couple weeks after my last video. So it was like the week of Christmas of, of 2022. It was something like the 20th of December. Uh, and it was a no. <laughs> they rejected the, the claim uh, based on lack of medical evidence. Um, and the thing is, I did like a self-report when I first uh, when I first made the claim, uh, but that was before my second infection. So that was before I got like much worse again. Like my initial thing was, it'll be a few months, I don't know. Um, and then when they finally got the medical records through in November, I was like, hey, can I add to this? Can I give you an updated, updated thing? Can I get an updated letter from my GP? And they were like, no, they already have all the information. So they rejected based on lack of medical evidence. I was like, that's very annoying, but also fair enough because I, I didn't get to give the actual story of what had gone on since. Um, so I had to appeal it and I appealed it in January um, and I was really <laughs> worried about it. So this art project was gonna come out in March and I needed to post some like blog posts leading up to it. They weren't, um, they weren't like essential. It was just like, I don't feel like I've done anything properly until I've also explained the process behind it. Like, <laughs> like with this, I, part of my process of like learning something and doing a project is the, um, is the sharing of like what was underneath the thing. Uh, so I wrote these like technical blog posts and I was gonna start posting them a few weeks before the project went live. And I sent off this appeal. I got a letter from my GP that was like, you know, I've been treating her personally since June. And you know, this, these are all the problems. This is the treatment. I've tested for POTS. She has POTS that might contribute to her fatigue. Um, like she's seeing a neurologist, like I'm referring her to cardiology, all these things. And then I also got a letter from the consultant neurologist saying, I'm trying to treat her with this thing. She has an unusual thing with her, with her vision. Um, I think like until she improves a lot, she won't be able to do her job. And, um, and the GP also said that they both said, if she try and push this through, she'll get worse. And I, she's not well enough to work basically. So I was like, this is kind of ironclad, right? Like, <laughs> how could you, how could you say that that's not legitimate? But I only filed the appeal in whatever it was, early February. And I needed to post these, start posting these blog posts because I was going to post them weekly. And I was waiting on the, I was waiting on the result from the appeal because I just worried that as soon as they saw a blog post, they were gonna say, look, she's working. She's work like she can do her job because this is all like technical and stuff. Even though all of the work for the, all of the like meaty work for the project I did before I got sick. Um, and lo and behold, I start posting the blog post. I get their response to my appeal and it's a, we don't think your medical evidence is strong enough because there's no prognosis, there's no treatment plan, and um, and there's and it's like self-reported, it's not objective. So that was one arm of, the, <laughs> of their rejection, and the other arm was like, look, she wrote this blog post, and it's sim like it's similar technical skills to what she has to do for her work, and like she literally says in the conclusion that this is like the most like technically challenging thing she's ever undertaken. To the first point there's no prognosis because no one fucking knows. Like no one can say that she's gonna be better in X amount of time because it's, a, it's an unknown illness, you know? It's not, um, it's not something they have objective tests for because it's, it's diagnosed as by elimination and by subjective descriptions of symptoms. Like that doesn't mean it doesn't exist just because they don't have a fucking test for it. Anyway, so that was annoying. Um, and I think that was just wrong. I think that was just like, not okay for the insurers to say that because on all my letters it literally says shouldn't work um and then the other thing i was like i've got them there because i can prove because all of all code is i mean i work at github which is the place where all of the code is stored and the way you do coding is that you save little increments over time of changes you make and you add descriptions of what you're doing at each of those little stages so that you can jump back and forth and like see the see something over time. Um, and uh, that means that I had like empirical evidence that all of the like code samples from my blog post, I literally wrote in October, 2022. <laughs> I said this to them and they were like, no, this is our final decision. If you want to pursue this further, you're going to have to take it to the financial ombudsman service, which is a free service. It's one of those things where it's like, it's kind of governmental, but it's also kind of not like it's an, it's a national thing where 
they have the right basically to make judgment calls on financial services where like customers feel aggrieved but it is a very long process uh it can take like many many months to be assigned to someone um and it's very kind of ambiguous the timelines and stuff but i was like look i have an ironclad case here because it's the, all the, the stuff they're saying about the medical evidence is dumb and um i can prove that i wrote the blog post the, all of the stuff in the blog post was from before and i can also show that like yeah i did manage to write a blog post over the course of getting sick it was just one blog post that had been released at this time but i can show that i started that blog post in september like it took me five months to write a blog post that is not the same as being able to like work in a like high stress technical role you know um so I applied for the Ombudsman in whatever it was, March last year, March 2023. Ooh. And then this project comes out in mid-March and I make a lot of money on it. We'll go into detail in that after we get through this Ombudsman section. But um, I make a lot of money on it because it's a really prestigious platform and like I had, I really didn't, you, you actually don't know until it happens like how much you're gonna make or like whether people are gonna buy at all. It's very, very stressful, but I did make a lot of money on it. So that's good because I was like financially comfortable so I could wait out this entire ombudsman process. I think in July or August was when I first was first told, hey, an investigator's been assigned, like they'll be in touch. So in September, he got properly in touch and he said, okay, you said that you have proof. Can you like provide that proof? So I put together this document with all the like screenshots of different code. You do have to be quite technical to understand this, but I was like, here is the blog post. And then here is a snippet of code that says it's from October, 2021. So I may have said October, 2022 a bunch, whatever. It was from before I got sick. Uh, you can these words are the same <laughs> like this is proof and also i included um what's called your contribution log on github which shows it's uh it's optional but you can basically show everyone like the world how much you do each day like basically like it's a i'll, I'll put it here this is my contribution log from i think it was august 22 to august 23 so this is showing how often i do anything on this website uh, it's really handy having like literally the data of what work I've done, what work I've done. Um, so I provided that piece of evidence to him. And I also said like at the end of it, hey, but I feel like there's a missing part of this equation where like they didn't address the fact that I can't sit at a desk for several hours. They didn't address the fact that like I can't do like video Zoom calls. Like they just said, you wrote this blog post and therefore you can do your job. And it's like, those are not the same skills. Um, anyway, so October arrives and I hear back from the, from the investigator of the financial ombudsman service and he has decided in my favor. And this is huge because not only do it, would I get back pay 75% for like that entire year, I would also be receiving 75% of my base salary, which is high base salary. I work in tech for ever like until i get well enough to work or i retire or die basically or decide to leave the company for whatever reason so the the, the problem is that for the insurers this is a multi-million pound insurance case oh and by the way the investigator was like yeah i think it's totally reasonable for there not to be a prognosis this is long COVID, like it's an emerging thing like just really reasonable and being like i've seen through her evidence like there's nothing she's not being contradictory at any point like this all seems legit and I was like oh finally I'm being heard um but the thing with the ombudsman is that there's like the initial investigation stage and most claims get resolved at that stage um because a lot of the time it's like not worth the company's time these can be really small claims they can be PPI claims they can be like a few hundred quid on a car insurance they can be like my my flight was cancelled I didn't get the money back like they can be quite small claims um but this is obviously a big claim. So they didn't want to accept the um, investigator's findings. So there's a second step um, called the Ombudsman. So it's the Financial Ombudsman Service, but an Ombudsman is a particular person and they get assigned the 10% of cases that don't get resolved at the initial investigation stage. So I was then like, oh my God, this is, I am at that point, I am, for things coming later, come on, no longer in a very comfortable financial position. I am in a lot of trouble. And I'm like, I'm in a lot of trouble. Can you speed this up? Because I do do that in cases where like somebody is like really struggling financially. Um, and within 
one week, I got a provisional decision from an ombudsman. So within a week, it was assigned to an ombudsman. They looked through all the case files and they gave me a provisional decision and it was not in my favor. The main reasons the insurers didn't agree with the ombudsman decision is that they were like, A, she was working. She's now sh explained, she said in her evidence document where she was explaining the blog post that she was running out of money and had to release this thing because she needed to make money. If she's making money from, A, we think this is work, but B, she's not allowed to make money from anything. Like, or she can't do anything that even has the potential to make money. That is against the terms of the policy. Um, and B, we don't think, we still don't think that the medical evidence is valid. Um, and C, we, they also just added a bunch of other things to sort of like diminish trust in what I said. Um, so they brought up a tweet where I said I was going to a conference. Um, they also mislabeled it as going to a jewelry conference and it was not about that. It was a web conference. Um, but they said that shows like higher working capacity than she's expressed, which is contradictory to what she said. Um, when this was a single tweet I wrote saying, uh, really excited to go to this conference that's down the road from me. I've literally been, I've been saving my energy all week. I hope I make it through the day. I don't feel like as an expression of like, this girl can work. This is saying, I didn't do anything for a week so that I could try and sit in a comfortable cinema for a day. Um, and then the other, the other thing they brought up was um, that I went to the Grand Prix in Hungary and they were like, she can plan and execute on travel, which also shows a higher like functional capacity. And the story they got that from was the last video I made where I was saying that I couldn't give up on this holiday going to the Grand Prix in Budapest. So I got assistance on the airplane, which was the only way I could get there. And then I had a huge episode like at the circuit and had to be carried away in a taxi and lie in the dark still silence for two days before I could even like speak or move. Like, <laughs> I just don't know how you can take it, take that story and interpret it as, oh, she's able to plan and travel. Like it's, oh my God, it was, it made me so angry. They basically just called me all of these terrible things. And then the ombudsman like just agreed with them and like put that all in, in this provisional decision as if like they were, they were telling the, the truth and it wasn't verified or anything. So um, anyway, so I had, two weeks to come up with a response to his provisional decision. And the way it works is that if I could change his mind to flip it in my direction, he has to release another provisional decision and then they get to respond to that as well. Uh, but I was like, they just, it's just that the last thing the ombudsman's heard is this diatribe from the insurer, like discrediting me. Um, so surely if I diatribe back, like he should flip my way because I am being reasonable. I'm not able to work. Um, so I wrote this long thing uh, about um, a, they'd in the provisional decision totally misinterpreted the like activity log contribution thing that I shared. Um, so, so I had to set them straight on that. I explained about how when I went to this conference, I felt terrible. I missed half the sessions. I had to go home in the middle of the day to lie down. And when I was at the conference, I was sitting with my legs out on the floor. Here is a photo of me at that conference, sitting with my legs on the floor. This does not show that I am capable of doing things. And similarly, like here's the video that that story from the Grand Prix is about, like it does not show capacity. <sighs> um, and then the other thing is this working while sick thing. And it's really dicey because there are so many different tacks I could take with it. For example, I didn't make any money at the point where the uh, where like the appeal uh, was rejected. I hadn't made any money from the project. I didn't like at that point reasonably expect to make money from the project. Like it was it's it was still so tentative. So that those things obviously the almost all of the work for the project that I did make money on I did before I got sick. Um, the you know the point of that clause is is to not um, is for people that are on long term leave to not be able to kind of like use that time to make money that they wouldn't have got while they were working, um, which I didn't do because I'd done mo most of the work I did almost all of that work in like a three and a half month span before I got sick, and then it took me over a year to do the final twenty percent. Um, oh, I had so many other points. I had so many points. Um, but yeah, they were all sort of dicey because like I had been doing things, but it wasn't really commensurate to the type of work I do in my job. It wasn't at, like a pace that is suitable for my job. I wasn't gonna make money from it, but I did, but that was outside the time. So a lot of these kind of like little arguments, um, but then fundamentally, 
what I realised is that the only reason I did all this is because it took them like seven months to give me an initial decision on the claim and I didn't have any money. A big part of my argument was like, here are all the delays in this, in, in the in the initial decision that were definitely caused by the insurer um, that I uh, I wasn't at fault for and I didn't have any money. They forced me to try and make money out of something that I had done before I got sick. Like I don't, I don't think it's fair and reasonable for them to reject the claim on this basis. And then when it came to the medical evidence, I was like, I couldn't get a letter from the consultant neurologist because he discharged me because there was nothing more he could do, not because I was better. Uh, but annoyingly in his letter back to my GP, he said, she's showing signs of improvement. Um, when I hadn't said that. And my GP would say, like a lot of the things hadn't come out that she'd been talking about. Like I hadn't actually been seen by the card cardiology and been treated for POTS. So I didn't think there was anything she could add by writing another letter besides basically saying the same thing. Like she's still sick and like she still can't work. That's what I said in the original letter. So I was like, I'm, I'm gonna present the same medical evidence and just point out that like, they both say, if I try and work, I will get worse. Also, I did try and do that in April, 2022. I did try and return to work. And then I was advised to stop by my GP because I, I was getting worse and like, I couldn't manage it. Um, so I felt, I felt really confident in this argument. Um, and I was also like, well, the, the, the case handler, the initial investigator, like was reasonable and on my side, surely an ombudsman would see this and be like, you know, this is the person who is trying to get by, like trying to do something, something to give my life some meaning and trying to like be financially stable um, and not, I, when I'm still not able to work. Anyway, so it took a week for the, the ombudsman to make that uh, provisional decision and then they gave me they gave me two weeks to give my answer and they said if you if you reply sooner than that I might be able to give you a final decision before then. So as soon as I sent this thing in, I was like every day I felt so sick. I was I was not sleeping. I felt anxious all of the time. I know I I know I did everything I could. Like I had I had a, a independent legal advice about it. I had several lawyer friends read it through. I had loads of friends and family members read it through and pick through my arguments. And I like, it was as airtight as I was capable of making it. If you're a reasonable person, you would side with me. And uh, weeks went by and I, I, I was like, even in my case manager being like, please, can you let me know like when, when to expect this decision. Um, and he was like, I can't tell you, cause it was also like the week before Christmas. I was like, I don't want this ruining my Christmas again. Um, and he was like, I can't, I can't give you a timeline, but I'm in all of this Christmas period. So as soon as I get it, I'll get it, I'll give it to you. So I was like, okay, it's gonna arrive. It's gonna arrive any day. And it arrived yesterday. We're mid January now. Um, so it took seven weeks, seven weeks of like torture. Over this whole time, I've been really conscious of not sharing too much on social media, like not sharing, like I don't wanna say this thing is improved because then they'd use that against me. So I have to be really delicate, but I still want to, I'm not gonna lie, but I wanna talk about my experiences. But it's just like, anytime I say like, oh, I'm, I'm doing this thing I'm excited for, I have to caveat it with, by the way, I'm still really sick and I'm gonna struggle doing it just so, they can't, can't take that out of context. And yet they still took all of those things out of context. So I was like, I can't, I need to just not say a thing. I need to just be mute and they can't hold my muteness against me. Um, but it's just like, I had that light worry this whole time, but just in the last few months, I've been like, just terrified of saying anything, um, which is a real bummer. And then part of the problem was that if, if, they, if I did succeed and I got the insurance, um, I then wouldn't be able to ever say anything online, basically. I wouldn't be able to do any work visibly that has the potential to make money or, or does make money. Um, and like, there's something very comforting about that because I can just lie back and be like, yeah, I'm making like a senior software engineer's salary, well, three quarters of it, and I can just watch TV all day. Um, but then like my passion, what I love doing is like, Sh making things and then sharing them, like sharing them as a key component to that. Making things without sharing them would just be sad. Um, so it was like a really sad prospect to think about abandoning. And like, I've been working on another art project for again, it's been over a year now. And I was like, I'm just gonna stop working on this because if I just, I'm just gonna have to abandon it if I get this insurance. So 
the last seven weeks have been really, really tough because I've, I've just been like constantly nauseous of like, when am I gonna get this decision? And also I can't do things I'm passionate about and A, and I might have to give them up forever, but you know, that's an exchange for some financial stability, which again, we'll come on to, I really need it at this point. Um, anyway, so I got the decision yesterday and as you can guess by the fact that I'm sharing this amount of information with you, it was a no. And it was basically, they basically just like didn't take on anything I'd said. Like they summarized what I'd said in my response. The medical information's all self-reported and it's like, there's no way, there's no way to for me to prove that I'm ill. Like every anything I say can only be used against me in these cases. It's terrible. Anyway, I I'm 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 really angry about it because I think they're wrong. I think it's I think it's cruel and harsh and I don't know how those people can live with themselves. I'm so confident I'm in the right because I know that I'm not capable of doing my job in any capacity. Like I could do a day in two half days, but only if like, I could be like, oh, I'm feeling ill today, I'll do it tomorrow. Like, I can't do my job in a way that would be useful for the company. Um, so I just feel really, really disappointed by it. But also I really surprised myself yesterday by being so happy because I didn't realize how much this like gag order had been getting me down um, and stressing me out. And I just felt so good that I could finally speak freely. And it, the thing is, I'm not saying anything contradictory to anything I've said before, because I'm being sincere, um, but uh, I don't have to worry about anything being misinterpreted because it's over, it's over, which is so, so good. I'm so glad it's over. It's been almost two years, like this, this insurance claim started in May, 2022. It's been over a year and a half um, waiting to find out if I'm gonna get this money or not. Although it's like really difficult for us financially, um, I'm just so glad that now I know where I'm at and I can make a plan and I can get back into making my generative art and I can make money from it. Like I'm not gonna make as much, I'm not gonna make it as reliably or as quickly and I'm gonna have to use a lot of my energy. Um, but at least I like now am in control and have some autonomy which is so good. So that is the story of my journey with the financial ombudsman. So what's happening now with work is they want to have a meeting with me next week. And the, I don't know what's going to happen, basically. They might say, okay, well, it's time to do a phase return to work then. They might say, we're letting you go immediately because like the evidence in the uh, in the insurance case shows that you weren't unwell. By the way, I have had continual sick notes. I I still am getting sick notes from my doctor saying I'm not well enough to work. Like there is still active, <laughs> if, you're, if you're any kind of sensible, there is medical evidence saying that I'm not capable of working. Um, so I have no idea what's gonna happen. I, um, I'm not really able to work, but I need, I need to make money. So I, I, that's a, it's a big question mark and I'll let you know eventually what goes down with that. And on top of all of that, another really, really, really terrible thing happened to me in the last year that's one of the worst things that can happen to someone. I think it sits right below terminal illness and like the death of loved ones. Um, I made a lot of money on that art project, remember, but I didn't have any expectation of being able to sustainably make money from that work. Um, so I also, when I got, first got long COVID, I got really into watching YouTube. I spend so much time watching YouTube, specifically DIY YouTube. I love to make things and I suddenly got really into watching carpentry videos and I've always wanted to have my own house and remodel it and do it up. My mum's an interior designer. I absolutely love that kind of stuff. And we were planning on buying a house, even, even like when I first got sick, we were still looking at houses. Um, but then uh, you know, it was sort, sort of put on the back foot until there was this thing where I was gonna get a load of money. So what we ended up deciding to do was buy a cheaper house um, that wasn't really suited to our needs. Um, and we kind of had to do that anyway because I wouldn't be able to get a mortgage. Um, so it would all have to be in Brian's name so we could only take a salary into account so we just wouldn't be able to afford much more. So we're gonna buy a crappier house that he was gonna buy and then I was gonna spend all of the money doing up. So we found this house, it's it's in the perfect location. Um, and I 
was also, I was really sick. So I, although I want to do all the DIY, I'm not physically capable of it. We, we wanted to just have it be a nice space. Um, but then when we had the survey done and stuff, there was a lot of issues with the brickwork in the loft. And this is a Victorian terraced house, like a two up, two down situation. And we wanted to do a loft conversion, but not like only if I made loads of money from this project and um, not, otherwise we wouldn't have done it immediately. But there was this issue with the brickwork in the loft. So we we're like, okay, we're gonna commit to doing this now. Um, and it sort of spiraled into like a complete gutting of the house, which is sensible because it did have a lot of structural issues, like the wiring was old, the plumbing was old, it was moldy, like a lot of problems. I wanted to break down some walls. I wanted to do the, the loft conversion. Um, and what we did was we hired a builder, a full service builder to do all of this work. Uh, so we bought the house um, in April, last year, April, 2024. A lot of things went on in March, April last year. And I was looking for a builder to start immediately because it was gonna be unlivable during that time. So we were gonna continue renting this house while that house was being done up. And I was so conscious because I wasn't making any money, like sustainably, um, I was so conscious of us paying double rent and mortgage that I wanted it done as soon as possible. So I was like, I can't be bothered to wait a month for the architect to completely finish his plans. It's a standard loft conversion. How hard can it be? Um, so I found, a builder who was willing, who was like, I've done a ton of these, like, it's fine. Um, we can just go along with it. Quote was much more than expected, but then I sent it to like some other builders that I'm in contact with. And everyone was like, this isn't reasonable. You should go ahead with it. And like, they seem like nice guys. And we paid 25% upfront. And that was for them to secure the materials because materials were going up in price and they just wanted to lock them in early. I was like, that actually does seem reasonable and sensible because I don't want it increasing in price. Um, and then we were paying them like every fortnight and they did like the first the first Monday after we got the keys on the Friday, they ripped out the kitchen, like so much destruction so quickly. And it really felt like a lot of things were moving on. And it was, um, and there were like a few problems. Like they had a steel beam that was meant to be put in that wasn't the right size, that needed to be replaced. Um, there were like a few things that went wrong, but generally it was going okay. And suddenly we didn't have a roof. The roof was off because they started building the, the dormer out the back. So it wasn't just a, it wasn't just like a loft conversion where you add some windows. It was like you pop out the back and make that like a full height space with a bathroom and everything. Um, and, uh, it was all really exciting. And then one day, um, they, they just started having loads of problems and like, I don't, there's no point me telling you all of the story, um, in detail, but basically like they weren't around for ages. And then a new crew came in in like July. We were supposed to be in end of June. A new crew came in over like July um, and then they disappeared again in August. And the guy was like, oh, I, I'm gonna get you another crew. And I just didn't trust those people, like whatever. And then he just kept ignoring my calls. And then in late September, um, we realized they'd gone bust and um, they had, totally abandoned the project and had no money and were not going to do any more work on it. And we had paid them the entire bill minus the last payment because they were they were sort of like, well, once once we finish all the structure work, everything happens really quickly. So like we're not very far off our um, projected timeline and uh, and things even by that point when I was making the last couple of payments, I was like, it still feels fine. Like it's, <laughs> things are still okay. Um, but yeah, I paid over 120,000 um, pounds. <laughs> and I was left with a house that had serious damp issues because they left the roof off for ages and didn't cover it. And even when they did cover it, it still left things in to the point where we had to pull, rip out, they ripped out all the plaster. They ripped out all of the original floorboards, even though I specifically said, are these damp issues gonna ruin the floorboards? And they're like, no, they ripped out all the floorboards. They left an absolute mess behind and they, take 120,000 pounds of my money. So that 120,000 pounds was all my money. Brian paid for the deposit for the house and like owns the house. All of my money was a renovation. And so half of that was my life savings. So that's money I made out of the house I used to own with my brother and money I'd like saved in ISAs over the years. The other half came from the art project. So the art project was, I had to save half of it for tax, cause corporation tax and like, income tax for the future. And then the other half was like my expenses living for the last year and the other half of the, the money that I spent on the house. Um, so suddenly we had a completely unlivable house, no money, and we were still paying rent and mortgage. There's no way for us to get that money back 
Um, I don't need advice on that. We've got all of the advice and there's nothing we can do about it. Uh, it's a very bad law in the UK. I'll leave a link to a petition down below that my, my friend Bev from Trading Standards is a big fan of, which is like, regulate builders so they can't do this. Uh, but yeah, it's just a, a really, really, really terrible thing that happened. And we had a professional assessor come in um, like the week after we found this out uh, to kind of catalog the damage so that if we ever could take legal action in the future we know exactly what we claim for and they estimated that we were owed £103,000. So we we're in a house that needed £103,000 of work to get it up to the like a living standard basically to, to be finished. Um, and also that didn't include even the kitchen, a whole separate thing. We're building the kitchen ourselves from wood. This is, this is the evolution of my new obsession with carpentry. And I really wanted to start a DIY YouTube channel talking about how to um, still like do DIY and decorate and interior design with like accessibility in mind and with like, like a chronic illness, how those things are still possible for you if you like pace the right way and think smartly and stuff. I thought it'd be a really interesting angle for a YouTube channel. I'm still obsessed with that idea, but it's on the back burner now because I need to actually make money. Um, but yeah, so we're building the entire kitchen ourselves. So that's also an extra cost on top of that that we have to add because we that doesn't include like appliances and countertops and stuff. None of that was in the original spec of the builder, nor was any of the like porcelainware. Um, so there was still extra costs on top of that. Um, and this is like all around the time that all of this ombudsman stuff is happening as well. So we are in hell. Once again, I have no income. Brian's income does not cover the rent and the mortgage and our living expenses. Um, so we're in deep, deep trouble. So there are a few things we could have done, but we've gotten so far selling the house, it would be worth less than it was before. Like we would be in the even worse state. So we decided to find a new builder, continue working on the house, but like try and scale back as many things as possible, cut as many corners as possible. Like we're, we're only having one bathroom now. And when I say we're only having one bathroom, we're leaving the original bathroom, just like a destroyed mess and like building, <laughs> finishing the new one in the loft. Um, and, uh, we are doing everything as basically as cheaply as possible, but without it being a crappy house. So like, for example, we had all of the radiators taken out because we were going to do underfloor heating. Actually putting the radiators back in would really influence the design and be a huge mess. So we're still going to do underfloor heating, but we're going to lay all the panels and the pipes ourselves. We're going to lay the flooring ourselves. And yesterday we decided to ax even having a kitchen countertop because that's three grand that we don't need to spend. We're not going to have doors. We're not going to have architraves. We're not going to have skirting. Um, we're not going to have carpet in the loft. Uh, we are not going to have any of the built-in storage that we need to have that I want to build eventually. It's going to be like a sad place to live. So what we did to get the money to do this, that you know how that money I had set aside for tax? I could not spend the corporation tax because that's due in May, but the other stuff won't be due for two more years. So that was £45,000, I think, £50,000. Um, that I decided to risk spending now to try and make our house livable, um, even though I will need that money in two years time. Uh, so, and the thing is we got these new builders in that we love, we love them so much, but they were like, there is a lot wrong. They, the work that the previous builder did was bad. There is way more water damage than there was before. We had to replace basically every joist and internal wall in the entire house. Um, it, so it's even more, it's even more money than, than that. Like a lot of the things in the loft, um, it was just built wrong. So we had the end that wasn't known when we got the assessment. So they just had to redo it. And like, it's been really, really, really stressful spending money you don't have on something that continually gets worse. Um, so that, that 45 grand got us to Christmas and that finished all the structural work mostly. And now we're at the, um, we've just finished the first fix plumbing and electrical, uh, and we're just starting plasterboarding. Um, and Brian's taken out a big personal loan, uh, which even at the end of that, we're not going to have, we're not going to have enough to finish the house with. Um, again, I don't have any money. <laughs> Uh, and I, I do, I should be getting a tax refund and also I'm still hopefully getting shares from my company. Um, but it's literally not enough to live off, but we still need to move into the house. We don't have to keep paying for this house. It's just the most, it's like the work, like it's unbelievably bad. Imagine someone stealing 120,000 pounds from you. And like, it's 
for us, it's not too bad. Despite my chronic illness, we are in a good place for the long term. We are both like well-educated, work in a, in a competitive industry, um, like we'll be fine. This builder like screwed over some people's life savings that were like in their 60s and like building their retirement house. Like at least we're not in that position. Um, like we will be fine eventually, but this is like the hardest time. It's the hardest time. Imagine, I'm at, like it's, I, I almost can't believe that I'm okay day to day because I'm chronically ill, I can't do much. Um, we have all of this financial stress and all of this house stress and like all of this admin that needs to go along with it. And then I have this huge stress of the financial ombudsman. And it's unbelievable, like, thank you, Sertraline. I could I could not do this without antidepressants. I don't know how, I don't, I don't, I don't know. Um, anyway, so we're still in the midst of the pit, but hopefully we're coming out of it. So now we get to me groveling, I've actually, uh, activated YouTube memberships on this channel and also super super likes where you can make a donation in a comment. I don't like having to ask for money, I don't like having to borrow money from people um, and again we'll, we'll be fine in the long term, there are probably people that need um, money more than us but in the short term we are really 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 struggling so if you are in a position where you can give us money the, that option is available to you. <laughs> if you've been like, you've watched this whatever two hour video now and you're like, wow, this girl's got some shit going on. Um, you are welcome to help us out. And um, I don't know what the future holds. Despite all of these hardships, um, we still have a very good relationship and a very good dog and great friends. So, uh, and like at least we have been living in a comfortable place this entire time, even though it's obviously been very expensive and we've now been paying double rent and mortgage for like 10 months almost, nine months. At least we're not living in an absolutely unlivable house. So that's nice. Um, I actually don't think you can experience true gratitude for the simple things in your life without having to go through a lot of hardship. <laughs> but I'm now at the point of like, I just love so much. I, I I love so freely and so openly because I've <laughs> been through so much shit recently. I was having a cry in bed last night to Brian and I, I, I just said, someone that grew up as rich as me and is as smart as me shouldn't have this hard a life. Like, it shouldn't be possible. Anyway, we're, we're wrapping up now. Uh, maybe my old nicotine patches will come in clutch and the week that I lose all the potential of, of getting money, I also totally regain my independence. I would like to end with a little vlog I made because you may be thinking that I seem very switched on and together today and I'm sitting up and I'm telling you about all of these things. Um, it's, it's quite hard to relate some of the experiences I've talked about, especially when it comes to my fatigue, to how I act on camera sometimes. Um, so I had this idea, I think it was actually ages, it was like last February or something, um, to make to film myself while I was having a fatigue episode. So um, that shall play you out now. And um, thank you so much for getting to this point in the video. Um, and yeah, I, I'll, I want, this has been very cathartic. I really, really, I was so excited to make this video. I made it the day after I found out about this stuff. Um, it's really what I needed. So I'm looking forward to sharing a bit more of myself again online. Um, and yeah, I hope if you have long COVID, this has given you any amount of comfort or, or knowledge, um, and you can get through, you can get through anything. If I've learned anything, it's that we're resilient people. We're adaptable people. We can, we can manage it, you know, even if like, I can't lift my head off a pillow for like an entire day, we're, it's okay. It's going to be all right. It's going to be okay. All right. Goodbye. I don't know why this has never occurred to me before, but here is a dispatch from the depth, the depth of an episode. Um, I was feeling fine when I woke up and um, I was watching a video on my phone and within 30 s seconds I just like completely lulled 
and right next to me to, 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 to took my phone away and headphones off and he got me my eye mask and put it on and I, I just I just I just I just I just I don't I don't usually talk this much when I feel this bad I'm a tippy tappy dog um I uh what was I saying oh I I slept for three hours my legs really hurt I slept for three hours and uh, because when my legs hurt that much I I need to, to just sleep it off um I uh I woke up to 10, 15 minutes ago and uh, still feel really t t ter terrible, can't really m move or think or c c concentrate. Hello, um, I thought I'd do a little update about half an hour after m the last thing I recorded. Um, Brian has very kindly bought me some tea and some pitters and I ate them and that was really um good good because I have eaten today um until until then um which was good um so yeah uh I think that today I'm like this all um, this is just, just what, what life is like sometimes at the moment. And I know it's because I went on a long walk, walk yesterday, but I really, really, really needed some fresh air and, uh, to see my dog having fun and I needed I needed it I needed to do it even though I knew that it would probably make 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 me feel terrible for a couple of days. Anyway anyway this is already really boom because I speak slowly. Uh but I think I'm part I'm part I'm part I'm past the point where I'm cross-eyed. That's nice. And I can watch YouTube videos. Um, I can't m move that much. But I can kind of concentrate as long as it's not too busy. Anyway, um, that's, that's dispatches from the... Um, mm in the depths of feeling crap. Oh, I can't really move my arm right now, so turning off this video is going to be difficult. <sighs> Alright, I'm going to try creeping, creeping forward. There we go. I got it. Bye. Hello. It's an hour or two later, and um, I've moved to the sofa, and I can move now, which is nice. But um, my eyes are crossed a lot, and my l my legs really hurt. My legs hurt so much. Oh, it's too tiring holding up. Um, but I've got a little dog on my chest, so that's nice. Um, but yeah, my legs really really hurt. <sighs> okay, bye. All right. Yeah, today is Tuesday. It's two days after my last videos. Yesterday I felt okay. I, I could get some work done and I didn't need anything. I was fine. And then today I woke up. I had some pancakes because it's pancake day. And then I was like, I feel so rotten. I was meant to have a meeting. I had to cancel it and I came up to 
bed and I've been asleep for the last three or four hours and now I'm awake and I still feel totally rubbish and my body wants to sink down towards the centre of the earth and it needs to be really flat and I need darkness. Hmm, what's annoying is that this, like, on Sunday I knew that it was because I'd gone on that walk on Saturday and it was a punishment. But today, I was really good yesterday. I was really chill. Well, this is just... Oh God, my jaw hurts. Oh, this is just so random. Like, it's so... And so unattributable. My, it's a roll of dice every day when I wake up if I can do anything that day. Today I think I'm going to stay in bed probably. Mr. Rockwood. Yeah. Mm, you don't want this disease. <laughs>